Last Sunday morning, I preached a sermon based on the text of Acts chapter 10, and today I present part two, a follow-up lesson to the one that we looked at last week. We learned last week from a study of Acts chapter 10 that this chapter is very unique. It is unique in that we have in this chapter the first Gentile Christian, Cornelius. We learned last week that this man was a good man. In the opening lines of Acts chapter 10, we find that he was a devout man, one that feared God with all his house. He gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He was not only a good man, but he was a good military man. Not only was he a good military man, but he was one who had a good reputation even among the Jews. Acts chapter 10 and verse 22. We know that he was one who had personal devotional time. He prayed in his home. Acts 10 verse 31. Ultimately, this man, though already good morally, was receptive to the gospel message. When he heard the message preached, he responded in gospel obedience. He could have reasoned, well, I'm already a good person. In fact, I am better than most. He could have reasoned, I already have a relationship with God. I pray to him on a regular basis. I fear him, so I don't need the message. But this man was different. He humbled himself and was obedient to the gospel of Christ. His conversion contains many principles and lessons which will help us today learn how sinners become Christians. And so today, let's consider further the theme, Cornelius, a Gentile who feared God. Cornelius, a Gentile who feared God. In this lesson today, there are two points. Point number one, his conversion was unique. Cornelius' conversion was unique. Why do I say that? Well, in the opening part of this chapter, we find that This good man was told to send for Peter. And he was instructed to do this by an angel. Let's read now Acts 10 beginning at verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently, about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. So the angel instructed him to send for Peter. There are those who at this point in the chapter might begin to reason, well, this man was already a saved man. He saw an angel of God. The angel spoke to him. Surely this is evidence that he was already saved. I had a study with a gentleman quite a few years ago who was persuaded that he had seen an angel. As we were studying, he told me, he said, Brother Mark, I had a dream, and in this dream there was an angel, and the angel appeared to me. He said that he actually appeared. Though it was a dream, somehow the angel was at the foot of my bed. And he began to talk about what the angel had said. And he was persuaded that this 
vision, this appearance of an angel had great significance and that it was evidence of his salvation. Well, I tried to reason with him and I wasn't successful, but I am happy to say that later this man obeyed the gospel and he learned that whatever he saw, whatever his experience, that it did not save him. But he obeyed the gospel, became a New Testament Christian. There is no evidence that Cornelius was a saved man at this point. But there is evidence that he was a lost man at this point. In Acts 10 verse 6 we read that he was to send for Simon who would tell him what he quote ought to to do. In other words, he would be commanded to do some things, and we'll see that in just a little while. In Acts 11, verse 14, we find that Peter would tell him words whereby he and his house could be saved. Well, if he needed to be saved, then he wasn't saved already, was he? In Acts chapter 10 and verse 43, we find that it would be through faith in the gospel that he would receive forgiveness. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him, shall receive remission of sins. Does the Bible say whosoever sees an angel will receive remission of sins? Does the Bible say that when someone sees a vision, he will receive the remission of sins? No. The Bible doesn't say anything like that, but there are many people who are persuaded that they have, have been saved, and evidence of that is... Well, I heard something, or I saw something. But the Bible doesn't say by seeing an angel, having a vision, having a better felt than told experience, you will be saved. The Bible teaches that through the gospel system, people are saved. His conversion not only is unique in that an angel appeared to him and instructed him to send for Peter, but his conversion is unique in that he received the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, before he was baptized. We just read that the angel instructed him to send for Peter. Well, Peter came and he preached the gospel to Cornelius and to his household. What words did he say? We know that he Cornelius needed to hear words that he might be saved. What words? Well, we have at least a portion of those words found right here in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. What did Peter preach to Cornelius? He preached about the death of Christ. He told him that Jesus had died for him, that he was buried, that he arose the third day, he preached the gospel. These are the words that Cornelius needed to hear. He needed to hear the gospel. And as Peter was preaching, something very unique happened. Begin reading with me now at verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So as Peter begins to preach, the Holy Spirit, quote, falls upon Cornelius. He receives the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. Now there are those who are persuaded by reading this that this is just proof positive that Cornelius was already saved. Otherwise he would not have received the Holy Spirit. Here is a man who received the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. And you are telling me that he was a sinner? That he was a lost man? 
Well, I'm not telling you that, but I am persuaded the Bible teaches that. Yes, he did receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the miraculous power of the Spirit. But this is not evidence that he was saved. The argument that one who receives the Holy Spirit before being baptized is proof that that person is baptized has a built-in assumption. And the assumption is that those who receive the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit are saved. That there's some saving benefit in receiving the Holy Spirit. But is that true? Does the Bible teach that principle that those who receive the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit are people who are saved? Suppose a man has a honey-do list, and this man, he begins the honey-do list by cleaning the windows. And as he cleans the windows, he notices that they are all in good, pristine condition. Later, he begins mowing the lawn. And as he is mowing, his sons are out there playing baseball in the yard. Later that evening, after he finishes his honey-do list, he notices that a window pane is broken. And he begins thinking to himself, those boys were playing baseball in the yard. And that's why the window pane is broken. That baseball must have hit the window. Well, he has an assumption. He assumes that because he knew the windows were in good condition at one point that day, and later his sons were playing baseball, that it must be that his sons broke the window. Well, that's an assumption, but is it true? Maybe as he was mowing the lawn, a rock came from underneath the mower and struck the window, and the window was broken. Just because the window pane was broken doesn't mean that the man's assumption is correct. And just because some people assume that Cornelius, having received the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, was saved, doesn't make it so. That doesn't mean that their assumption is true. Let's put it to the test. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, we find Jesus promising the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles. This is Acts 1, beginning at verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. He's speaking to his apostles, Acts 1, verse 2. And he says to them that you will receive the Holy Ghost not many days from now. In verse 7, he says, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, when did they receive the Holy Spirit? Turn just one page of your Bible to Acts, the second chapter. And in the opening part of the chapter, we find in verse 4, and they, the apostles, were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, if our assumption that Cornelius receiving the Holy Spirit proved that Cornelius was saved by receiving the Holy Spirit, then it must be that the apostles were saved on the day of Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit. But there's a problem with that. And the problem is that the apostles had been with Jesus for more than three years at this point. The apostles had been out preaching the message of the kingdom. The apostles had performed miracles prior to this time. Are we to believe that before the apostles received the Holy Spirit that they were lost sinners preaching to others about the coming kingdom of Christ? Are we to believe that Peter, James, John, all the apostles were lost before receiving the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2? If our assumption about Cornelius is correct, the answer would be yes, they were all lost before they received the Holy Spirit. Turn to Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, we find that Philip the Evangelist 
goes down to the city of Samaria and preaches Christ to the people of that city. In verse 12, the Bible says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So we have people who obey the gospel in Samaria. But now those people who had been baptized had not received the Holy Spirit. How do I know? Let's read further. In verse 14, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Are we to believe that the Samaritans, before Peter and John came, were lost? Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The Samaritans believed, and they were baptized. Were they saved? If they were, then they were saved before they received the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 8. 14 through 18. It must be that receiving the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 10 had no bearing on Cornelius' salvation. No, he wasn't saved by receiving the Holy Spirit. Does the Bible say somewhere that by receiving the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, one receives the remission of sins? It doesn't say that at all. It does say that he, Cornelius, needed to hear words that he might be saved, Acts eleven fourteen, not the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, but words. This does teach us that he would have to believe the gospel to be saved, Acts ten forty three, but it doesn't say that by receiving the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, he would be saved. Well, if he did not receive the Holy Spirit to save him, why did he receive the Holy Spirit? What was the purpose of it? Well, let's do this. Let's not take my word for it. Don't accept my interpretation or opinion. Let's just hear it straight from the Scripture. Three times we read why Cornelius received the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. Notice again in Acts chapter 10 and verse 44. The Bible says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. They of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter. Because, notice, that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Did you notice in verse 45, the opening line, that they of the circumcision, meaning the Jews, that they were astonished. Well, why were they astonished? They were astonished because they saw this man Cornelius, a Gentile, receiving the Holy Spirit. In the minds of the Jews, the Gentiles weren't worthy of salvation. They would not be admitted into the church. But now they know differently, don't they? Now they see firsthand that God bears them witness. That is, he bears witness that the Gentiles will be accepted into the church. Turn to Acts chapter 11. In Acts 11, after the events at the household of Cornelius, the Jews in Jerusalem, they want to know from Peter, tell us, why did you go down to the house of a Gentile and have association with him? Don't you know that the Gentiles are not worthy of salvation? That was the implication. Well, let's see what is stated in that context. In Acts 11, beginning at verse 15, Peter explains, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he had said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Notice in verse 17, God gave them, the Gentiles, the like gift as he did unto us. Us who? The apostles. 
What is he referring to? He's referring to Acts 2, when he and the other apostles received the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. He says, folks, I'm telling you, when I went to the household of Cornelius, they received the thing that we received on the day of Pentecost. What was I that I could withstand God? Meaning, who was I to reject them? Who was I to say that they could not obey the gospel? I'm beginning to see why Cornelius received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm beginning to see that it was to impress upon the minds of the Jews that the Gentiles would be admitted into the church. But turn to Acts chapter 15 and let's hear it in plain, concise language. In Acts 17, or rather 15, beginning at verse 7, the Bible says this, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren... You know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles, that's the household of Cornelius, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, notice, bear them witness. We should underline at least in our minds those three words, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us. And put, here it is, no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now I know why Cornelius received the Holy Spirit, the miraculous power of the Spirit. It was that through that, God was bearing them witness, showing that there was no difference between Jews and Gentiles, that both would be admitted into the kingdom of Christ, the church. You mean it wasn't to save Cornelius? No. Had no bearing on the man's salvation. That's why Peter had to come. Was to preach the message of the gospel that through the gospel Cornelius might be saved. Three quick lessons we learn from point number one by way of application. Number one, the gospel is for all. He put no difference between us and them. Acts 15 verse 9. What does that mean? It means the gospel is for all. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so you and I have an obligation to do what we can to share the gospel with all 1 Timothy 2, 4, Mark 16, 15, and 16. A second point of application, human agency is involved in the gospel, in saving men through the gospel. Sometimes those in denominational churches will say, now if you believe that teaching must be done, if you believe that one must hear and believe the gospel and obey, then you believe a man stands between the sinner and God. You believe that a man stands between the sinner and God. And that man, he is the means by which the sinner is saved. Well, I didn't put the man there. God put the man there. In Acts chapter 8, we read that Philip the evangelist was told to go to the eunuch and teach him the gospel. A man, Philip, taught the eunuch the gospel. I didn't put Philip between the sinner and God. God did. The angel did. In Acts chapter 9, we find that Saul of Tarsus was told to go into Damascus that he might find out what to do to be saved. Ananias, a man, went and told him. I didn't put Ananias between the sinner and God. God did. In Acts chapter 10, an angel told Cornelius to send for Peter. A man would come and preach the gospel. I didn't put Peter between Cornelius and God. God did. I didn't give the great commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus gave that commission. Jesus is the one who said to men, you go and you preach the gospel. 
But then also we should note that many passages of the New Testament concerning the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit are abused. Have you ever gotten someone else's mail? I would venture to say you have. I do quite often. And uh, generally I just take it back to the post office, give it to them. I have the wrong mail. Reading some passages concerning the Holy Spirit is kind of like reading someone else's mail. I say by that in Acts chapter 2 verse 4 we find that on the day of Pentecost the apostles were filled with the Holy Ghost. Now someone reads Acts 2 verse 4 and says, Now I believe that I am filled with the Holy Ghost. I believe that where I attend services, we're all filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, that's like reading someone else's mail. We have to read Acts 2 in context, and when we do, we'll see that the apostles received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What happened in Acts chapter 10 was very unique. And that leads to a second point. And the second point is this. The conversion of Cornelius was not unique. Wait a minute. I thought you said that the conversion of Cornelius was unique. Now you're saying it's not unique? Right. There's a sense in which his conversion account is very unique. An angel was involved. He received the Holy Spirit before he was baptized. But there's another sense in which it was not unique. Turn with me to Acts chapter 15 and notice what is written, what is written in verse 11. In Acts 15, we find the Apostle Peter speaking about what happened at the house of Cornelius. And he says this, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. We refers to Peter and other Jews. They refers to Cornelius and to the Gentiles. And what does Peter say? He said, I believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we will be saved in the same manner. That Jews and Gentiles will be saved in the same manner. Well, let's do this. Let's consider how the Jews were saved. And having established that, then we will know how the Gentiles would be saved. Because they would be saved in the same manner. Well, how were the Jews saved? In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, you re remember that there were Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven, Acts 2 verse 5. And it was on that occasion that the apostle Peter and the other apostles preached the gospel. As a result of their preaching, we find that there were those who were pricked in their heart, Acts 2 verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. About 3,000 received that message. They gladly received the word, Acts 2.41. And those who were baptized, they were saved and added by God to the church, Acts 2, 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We have just read how the Jews were saved. They were saved, about 3,000 of them, on the day of Pentecost, as they turned from their sins and as they were baptized for the remission of their sins. That's how they were saved. But the Jews and Gentiles would be saved in the same way according to Peter, Acts 15, 11. How were the Gentiles saved? Well, in Acts chapter 10, that's the very thing we're studying, how Cornelius and his family were saved. In Acts 10 and verse 43, as we read a little while ago, we know that Cornelius and his family would have to believe in Christ to be saved. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Not those who only believe, but those who have an obedient faith. Those who submit to his authority. Those who have that kind of faith. Through his name will receive remission of sins. So, the Gentiles would have to believe the message. In addition to that, we learn in Acts 11 and verse 18 that Cornelius and his family 
that they repented of their sins. The Bible says that the Gentiles were granted repentance unto life. That is, through the means of the gospel, they heard about Christ and they repented of their sins. Is there anything else they did to be saved? Well, that takes us back to Acts 10, the closing part of this conversion account. Read with me now in verse 47 where the Bible says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he, Peter, commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Why did this Gentile man who feared God need to be baptized? Why was Cornelius baptized? Well, again, it would be far better to read that answer from Scripture rather than taking my word for it. Don't accept my word. Just read what the New Testament says. In Acts chapter 2, that same man, Peter, the one who taught Cornelius the gospel, that very man was present on the day of Pentecost. And he tells us what baptism is for. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for. For what? For the remission of sins. That's why Cornelius needed to be baptized. It was for the remission of sins. You see, Peter was functioning under the terms of the Great Commission I mentioned a little while ago. It was to Peter and the other apostles that the Lord originally said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Peter, knowing that baptism is part of the gospel and men must submit to it to be saved, taught this man, Cornelius, to be baptized, that he might be saved. Yes, the same man who said on the day of Pentecost that baptism is for the remission of sins is the man who commanded Cornelius to be baptized. This is also the same man who would later write, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. It does what, Peter? It saves us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, baptism saves us. Peter is the one who, functioning under the terms of the Great Commission, commanded Cornelius to be baptized for the remission of sins as he preached on the day of Pentecost, to be saved as he wrote in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. And at this point, there are those who would say, but I just don't believe that baptism saves you. I just don't believe that there's some power in water to remove sin. Neither do I. I've never preached that. I've never heard any preacher of the gospel preach that there's some power in water to remit sin. The power is in the blood of Christ. Revelation 1 verse 5. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The question is this. When do we receive the benefits of the blood? When does the blood do the washing? If Cornelius was saved without baptism, then Cornelius was saved without being in Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3.27 If he was saved without being baptized, then he was saved without having his sins washed away. And now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Acts 22, 16. If he was saved without being baptized, then he was saved without being saved. Because Jesus said that he who believes and is baptized is the he who shall be saved. But to say that one is saved without being saved is of course an absurdity. How could a man be saved who isn't saved? The fact is, when Cornelius was obedient to the gospel, all of his sins were washed away. God added him to the church. And he goes down in biblical history as a Gentile who feared God and who was obedient to God. No one is so good that he can be saved without the gospel. Doesn't make any difference what a preacher might say at a funeral service. 
It doesn't make any difference how many times a preacher may say that he was a good man, she was a good woman. They did so much good in this world and we know now that that person is in the arms of Jesus. It doesn't matter, matter how many times that may be preached. Simply being good saves no one. We're saved through the gospel. That's how this man was saved. And until the Lord comes again, every sinner saved will be saved in that same manner. He put no difference between Jews and Gentiles. We're all saved by the gospel of Christ. Cornelius, he not only was a good man, but he was an obedient man. And it may be that someone here today has never <laughs> obeyed the gospel. You've never done what this man did. You've never submitted to baptism for the remission of sins. We're about to sing a song of invitation and you have a golden opportunity to become a child of God today. You're among people here who love you, who care about you. We want to encourage you in every way as we sing this song to consider where you stand with God. If you know in your heart what the Lord would have you do, do it while you have this time and opportunity. If you need to come home as a wayward child of God, why not make your calling and election sure and do that as together we stand.